front desk. And with that, I am going to invite Rebecca up. Um, Rebecca is from Jews for Jesus, and she's going to share and um, help us with looking at, I think you've got a little pamphlet there um, on your chair. Everyone should have one. I'll just grab one. Um, but this is the top, there's many topics that Jews for Jesus actually come and talk about, but this is the one that we've asked them to come and talk about today, which is Christ in the Passover. Really, really excited for this ministry today and to hear you teach us, because I know we're all going to learn a lot and that's going to be really enrich our faith, hey, and our walk with Jesus. So thank you so much. I know you're mic'd up there and I know you need some help to get this table up. Play, oh, so maybe first. while we, okay, we sure. bring the, yeah, yeah bring the table up. Hi everyone. Wow, I'm so, so, so excited to be here. I had the immense privilege of speaking at um, Riverstone, I think maybe like a couple of weeks ago or a little bit longer. And yeah, I've been so looking forward to coming here and sharing with you all. So I'm Rebecca. You might be able to pick up a bit of a Kiwi accent. I moved over here three years ago now uh, to work with Jews for Jesus. So Jews for Jesus, that video gave you a little taster of what we're about. Very simply, we are Jewish people who believe in Jesus. And we're in a different countries around the world, about 14 different cities where there are Jewish communities. And God has placed on our hearts the Jewish people and we want to share Jesus with them. Um, and I was getting so touched during the worship today with those songs talking about chains being broken and revival and I was just I could just see all the different Jewish people I know and speak to each week coming before my eyes and just yeah so thank you worship team for that worship I was very blessed and yeah I'm feeling a bit like oh how do I share after that but yeah I'm very very excited to be here and to share with you Christ in the Passover so I grew up in what you would call a messianic Jewish family. So what that meant for my family is we celebrated Passover and Easter. We celebrated Christmas and Hanukkah. Like we got, we basically got it all. We're very greedy. Um, but, but what I'm going to share with you today is something that I've grown up celebrating every year with my family. And that just makes me so much more excited to be like, this is what it's about. And I can share with you guys. Um, so I have a little slideshow and there's, I bought a couple. Let's see if they pop up. Yes, here we go. So just a little snapshot of the Bron family Passover, missing a few of my siblings, um, but this was during COVID. So, uh, but I just wanted to share, this is what the Passover table looked like in my family. So it was all set up with all these things, but also because Passover is depicting um, when the, the Israelites left Egypt, my mum likes to decorate the table with the plagues of Egypt. So we have little plastic <laughs> frogs and flies, and you can spot a golf ball for hay so honestly guys if you ever have Passover at my family's home the table looks wacky and you're probably like what is going on but it makes it very memorable and I think very memorable for me as a child growing up celebrating this um, so I want to start I have a couple of scriptures to read so I wanted to read just a few verses from Luke 22 and this is talking about when Jesus is celebrating the Passover, when he has this meal with his disciples. And we often know it as the Last Supper. So just a few verses, starting from verse 15. When the, uh, verse 14, actually. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. So we're going to talk about reclining a bit later. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So that is Passover in the New Testament. And I also want to read a few scriptures. Um, I have them up on the screen of Passover in the Old Testament. And this is when God is telling the people of Israel to keep the Passover. 
So he says, observe the month of Abib. This is one of the months in the Hebrew calendar. And keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. So the story of Passover has origins thousands of years ago. This is when God told Israel, I brought you out of Egypt. This was very, very significant. And I don't want you to ever forget what I did. So he put in place certain things for them to remember every year. They were to recreate the Exodus story. And this is what Jesus and his disciples were eating together. But we as believers know that God was thinking when God put Passover in place, it was actually pointing to Jesus. Because you see, the story of Passover is the central narrative of the Jewish people. It's a story about redemption. It's my story as a Jewish person, but it's also all of your stories as believers in Jesus. And it's a story that points us to the gospel itself. Now, often people are like, wait, how does Passover point to the gospel? Like Passover is a Jewish thing. Well, Jesus himself was Jewish. And today we're going to explore the story of Passover together. And I think as we do, as I walk you through different elements of Passover, you're going to be able to see the story of Jesus' death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. So I'm going to talk you through that. And then at the end, I'm going to take a few moments to tell you a little bit about what Jews for Jesus is getting up to here in Sydney and how you can uh, partner with us in the work we're doing. So in the verses I just read, it talked about leavened bread, unleavened bread. What is this? So God commanded Israel to eat bread made without yeast for seven days. And Passover marks the beginning of a seven day holiday, which is sometimes known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during this time, Jewish families don't eat any bread. They eat something called matzah. So I have matzah here. Not sure if any of you guys have tried matzah. Some churches actually serve this for communion, so I'm not sure. Yeah, you've tried it? Awesome. Uh, if you haven't, you're very welcome to come and try a little bit afterwards. It may be a little stale, but um, this is what Jewish people eat during Passover. So why couldn't they have any yeast in their bread? Why no leaven? Well, it's all about remembering. When the Jewish people left Egypt the first time, they didn't have time to let their bread rise. Like if you've read the Exodus story, you might remember this. They just, in ancient baking, a little bit of fermented dough is added to the main batch. This is what causes it to rise and puff up. This is what we've all made during COVID, or at least my family got into it, making sourdough. Um, so they didn't have time to let their bread rise up. So they took it with them while it was flat. And God said, you know, when you left Egypt and you took your bread with you and it was flat, I want you to eat flat bread every year for a week. And this will remind you of what your ancestors did when they left Egypt. So that's why. There's also another reason. Um, some biblical authors use leaven or yeast as a symbol for sin. And it's fairly easy to see why. In the same way that a little bit of fermented dough causes the main batch to puff up, just a little bit of sin in our lives, just a little bit, can cause us to puff up with pride and leave us quite sour. So the Apostle Paul actually applied this very ceremony. So at Passover, we remove all the yeast, all the leaven from our home as a symbol of removing sin from our lives. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul said, get rid of the old yeast so you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So I think every time you guys read that verse now, you'll be like, ah, oh, I know why he said that. Because he was Jewish and he was thinking about this Passover meal. Now, once the home is cleansed of leaven, it is ready for the Passover Seder. So Seder means order because the Passover meal follows a specific order of service. And this is found in a book called the Haggadah. Haggadah means the telling. So I have one here. 
You guys will be relieved to know we are not going to sit and read through the entire book. If you ever come to my house for a Passover Seder, we will. It takes a few hours. I got quite bored as a child. But today, we're just, I'm going to read through a few excerpts, a few of the important parts, and tell you some of the story of Passover. And you'll see you've all got a little brochure on your seat. Feel free to have a look through. We've pulled out some interesting bits for you to have a look. So Passover begins with the woman of the house, so it would be my mum, um, lighting the candles. And she says a traditional prayer in Hebrew, uh, which I'm going to say. And then I would love to invite all the ladies here to read along with me in English. So you've got it either in your brochure or up on the screen. So let me say it in Hebrew. And I pre-lit the candles because fresh candles don't always take. So let's see. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melcha alam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvah tov, v'tzivanu lahadlik nishel yom tov. And if all you ladies would like to read along with me, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to kindle the festival lights. Amen. And I love that the lighting of the candles belongs to the woman. This is her honor because the Messiah, Jesus, came into the world through the seed of a woman. And the prophet Isaiah foretold and said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, a light to light the nations and the glory of my people Israel. So it started now. The Passover Seder has begun. And there are four acts in the drama of the Passover Seder. So we fill and drink from our cups four times. And each cup has a different name and a different meaning. The first cup is the Kiddush cup or the cup of sanctification. The second cup is the cup of plagues. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And it's this cup that is the focal point of our entire ceremony. And the last cup is the cup of Hillel or the cup of praise. So what we do at the beginning is the head of the household. So my dad will take the first cup, he will fill it, and then he'll say a prayer over it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam amotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Nope, I said that completely wrong. You probably wouldn't know I said the bread one. Oh. No, I want to I get accurate. Let's try that again. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam berei peri ha'gofen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. And then everyone drinks from the cup. So we've now drunk from the first cup. Now, at the Jewish table, we always follow the blessing over the fruit of the vine with one for the bread of the earth. But at Passover, we don't have any bread. That's been banished from the house. All we have is matzah. So I think I've got a slide of it. Um, oh, the slides. Do you know what? I'm getting distracted by myself on the screen, but they are up here. So let's keep moving through. <laughs> you guys have a good system. All right, here we go. This is what I want to talk about, the matzah tosh. So there's no bread at the table, but we do have matzah. And the matzah is kept in this very interesting compartment called a matzah tosh. So inside the matzah tosh, there are three layers of matzah. And dad takes out the middle layer of matzah. And then he says a prayer over it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam amotzi lechem min ha'atz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then what he does is he breaks it in half, and one half is wrapped in a white cloth. And then this is now hidden. And it's called the afikomen, which in Greek means that which comes later. So it's literally hidden in the house. And later on, all the children go on a treasure hunt to find the afikomen. And the Passover Seder cannot continue until the afikomen is found. So as you can imagine, this was definitely my favorite part as a child. So we're going to talk a little more about the afikomen later. But the Seder's begun. And it's tradition for the youngest child in the family, unless they're a baby, to come forward and ask four traditional questions. So the first question the child asks is, why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we only eat 
unleavened bread? So that's the first question. And those of us who know the story of Passover are obliged to respond. And so we say, this is because of what the Lord did for me when he brought my ancestors out of the land of Egypt, when he saved me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, when he provided the sacrifice of the Passover lamb for my family. Now, my ancestors were instructed to take a lamb, a perfect lamb, and to paint its blood on the doorposts of their home. I'm sure we're all familiar with the story. Maybe we've read it in the Bible. Maybe we've watched The Prince of Egypt. Um, but those who painted the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their home were spared the ravages of the 10th plague, which was the death of every firstborn son in the land of Egypt. When the Lord passed through Egypt and saw the blood on the doorposts, death was forced to pass over. And that's where we get the name Passover from, or Pesach in Hebrew. And Guys, in the same way that my ancestors had to paint the blood of lambs over the doorposts of their home, we each as believers in Jesus have to paint the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, over the doorposts of our hearts. So the child now asks three more questions. And they might not make sense now, but we're going to talk through them. So the, the, the second question the child asks is, on all other nights we eat vegetables and herbs of all kinds. Why on this night do we only eat bitter herbs? Third question, on all other nights, we are not required to dip the herbs once. Why on this night do we dip them twice? So we're going to talk about the herbs in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about the last question. On all other nights, we eat sitting upright or reclining. Why on this night do we recline? So you guys might remember when I started, I read from Luke and it said Jesus and his disciples were reclining. Why were they reclining? What's all that about? So, and this explains the pillow. This is a visual representation of relaxing and reclining. Um, Passover is more than just a story. We're not just sitting around the table reading from a book, reading a story. We're actually reenacting it. We're tasting things. We are physically doing things. And in ancient society, only the free could recline at dinner. So it meant, you, it meant you were of high status, it meant you were rich and free, and you could recline and relax in, at dinner. Slaves couldn't do that. So the reason we do that now at Passover is basically to be like, we're not slaves anymore. God freed us from Egypt. We are also allowed to recline and relax at the dinner table. So that explains the reclining. Every year, each Jewish family recreates the Exodus experience. Each new generation must taste for themselves the bitter oppression of slavery and must long to savour the sweetness of freedom. So we're going to move on to the tasting part now. Um, this here is a Seder plate. So if you all open your pamphlets, on one of the pages it has a picture of what the Seder plate looks like at the Passover table. A little bit of food is placed in each compartment that represents the story of the Exodus, the story of Passover. Um, for you know, presentation's sake, I haven't done that today, but you can have a look in your pamphlets and see what it looks like. And I'm gonna talk you through what each of these things represent. So, the first thing we have is kapis. This um, represents life, it's greens, we use parsley, and it also represents the hyssop branch that our ancestors used when they painted the blood on the doorposts of their home. So what we do with the parsley is we take it and we dip it in some very salty water, and then we eat it. And the saltiness of the water reminds us of tears, and it reminds us of the tears of life, and that life for our ancestors in Egypt was a life full of tears because they were slaves. So that is the kapis. The next thing on our Seder plate is the chazaret, which is the root of a bitter herb. So we either use an onion or the root of a horseradish. We don't eat this, this is just representation. And it reminds us that the root of life was bitter for our ancestors in Egypt. The next thing we have on the Seder plate is the maror, which is the bitter herb itself. Now the rabbis say that you have to take a heaped teaspoon, enough to make your eyes water. So you guys will be very happy to know this is a presentation today. No one is obliged to eat horseradish, but oh my gosh, it's streaming. But it's good. You're supposed to cry. The tears again remind you of the sadness of life. 
By way of contrast, we have something sweet on the Seder plate. We have a haracet, um, which is chopped apple, nuts, honey, raisins. It tastes particularly delicious after we've just consumed a whole bunch of horseradish. This represents the mortar that our ancestors used in Egypt when they were making bricks for Pharaoh. So you guys might be wondering, wait, I thought we had to have salty and horribly spicy things. Why do we have something sweet on the Seder plate? How does that represent slavery? Well, the rabbis explain it like this. They say that even the hardest things in life can be made sweet by the promise of redemption. So that's how we get around that one. Now, the last two things on the Seder plate were added after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So these two things would not have been part of the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. But the reason we talk about them is that they're very important to us in the gospel story. So we have something called the Hagiga, and this is a roasted egg. And it quite simply represents the temple sacrifices. And during the Seder, it is sliced hand it out to everyone, we dip it in salt water, and again, the saltiness of this roasted egg represents the sadness we feel over the destruction of the temple. So it's just all remembering and contemplating. Now, the last item on the Seder plate is the Zoroa, which is the shank bone of a lamb. Passover is sometimes known as the feast of the Passover lamb, and the lambs that were eaten at Passover were temple sacrifices. But the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. The Jewish people have not had a temple since then. So at Passover now, lamb is not normally served. It's not tradition unless you're from New Zealand, like my family and not quite aware of that tradition and love a roast lamb for Passover. So first time I looked at this presentation, I was like, oh no, mum, we're very untraditional. I haven't had the heart to tell her. So we have lamb at Passover, but it's not so traditional. If you ever get invited to a Jewish person's home for Passover, you probably won't eat lamb anymore because there are no more uh, sacrifices, no more temple. Now, the presence of the egg and the shank bone do force us to ask an interesting question. We don't have a temple anymore. We don't have sacrifices. How now do the Jewish people atone for sin? It's a good question. I'm not sure if any of you ever wondered it. Like, wait, there's no sacrifices anymore. How do they do it? Well, the rabbis now say that atonement, forgiveness for sin comes through three ways, through prayer, repentance, and good deeds. But we know that the law of Moses clearly states that forgiveness for sin can only come through the shedding of blood. So those answers don't quite add up, like they don't quite work. Um, in today's seders, this kind of goes unresolved and unanswered, but we're going to answer it a little bit later. We're going to let that simmer for a bit. So now that we've gone through the Seder plate, we've dipped everything in salt and eaten horseradish, it's now time for the second cup, which is the cup of plagues. Now in Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy. But at this time in the Seder, we actually take time to remember the Egyptians and the destruction that came on them. So as a way of saying, okay, our joy is not complete, we're remembering with sadness the destruction that came upon the Egyptians, what we do with the second cup is we take our finger and we take 10 drops of the drink onto our plates as we recite the 10 plagues of Egypt together. So we'd go blood, frogs, etc. And we feel sorrow for the Egyptians and the destruction that came upon them as we do this. And we can also remember an important application for us in this cup. Pharaoh hardened his heart against God and it caused pain and destruction on those he loved. And we live in a postmodern society where often we believe the lie that our personal decisions are just that, that they're just personal. But when we don't follow God's leading in our lives, it can have repercussions on all of those we love around us. So that is what we can remember when we're going through the second cup. Now, once we have drunk from the second cup, we, we have a break. We come to the meal out itself. Um, by this point, we're quite hungry. We've kind of been nibbling on matzah. We're like waiting for dinner. Um, but before we all have a delicious meal together, there is another tradition that every family around the world will celebrate. 
Now, at the table, it's usually quite full. We've got all our family there. We've invited friends as well. And we actually have an extra plate and cutlery and cup. This is the extra cup that no one is using. It's just a spare one. This is for the prophet Elijah. So what we do, it's a very odd tradition, is one of the children goes to the door to check if the prophet Elijah is there. If he is, woo, we invite him in and he gets to sit at the table and have dinner with us. Like, amazing. So what, what on earth is that tradition about? Well, it comes from a prophecy from the prophet Malachi when he said that before the Messiah comes, the saviour that the Jewish people are waiting for, before he comes, he'll be preceded by the prophet Elijah who will announce him. So it's tradition at Passover to check if Elijah's come. So I, I really remember this as a child, like really believing when someone went to the door, like this ancient prophet from the Old Testament might be on the other side and might come in. And I was always like slightly relieved, but disappointed when he wasn't there. Like surprise, he was never there. He never came to our home. Um, <laughs> but now I'm a little older. I do know that when Jesus spoke of his cousin, John the Baptist, he said, if you care to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. So the forerunner to announce the Messiah has come. Like, we know this. Jewish people around the world are still waiting for the Messiah. They're still checking the door. But guys, we know. We, we know. He's come. So it's, John declared, like John saw Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the question of atonement has been answered. We know this. It's not through the blood of lambs anymore, but through the blood of the Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And as believers in Jesus, this Passover story is all of our stories. We too can pass over from death to life, from mourning to feasting. Now, after a delicious dinner, we come to the high point of the entire Passover Seder, and that is the third cup, the cup of redemption. But before we drink from this cup, do you guys remember earlier something was broken, wrapped up and hidden? Yes, so the afikomen needs to be found. So all the kids go on a treasure hunt. One of them finds the afikomen and gives it to dad and he gives them a prize or some money. He basically buys it back and now he has the afikomen. So what does he do with this? Well, he breaks it into small pieces and each person in the family gets a small piece which they drink with the cup of redemption. Does this look familiar? Yeah, so this is the origin of our communion service, which started at Passover. And the rabbis taught that the afikomen served as a symbolic reminder of the Passover lamb, which used to be the last thing eaten at a Passover meal. And at the most famous Passover meal of all time, Jesus broke the unleavened bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. So you see, this represented, it was a representation of the Passover lamb. So when Jesus broke it and said, he said, normally this represents the Passover lamb. Well, today I am that fill-in. I am the Passover lamb. It was always pointing to me. It now represents me. This is my body broken for you. You're not going to have to sacrifice lambs anymore. I am going to sacrifice myself for you. So that is what he meant with that. And there are very specific regulations in the way that matzah is to be made. Um, and obviously 2000 years ago, it did not look exactly like this, but it's quite interesting how much it can remind us of Jesus' body today. So I like to talk it through. Basically, you can see it has stripes on it. Well, Jesus was striped. The prophet Isaiah said, with his stripes, we are healed. It also is pierced. If I hold it in front of the candle, be able to see there's holes in it. The prophet Zechariah said, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So today's matzah really can remind us of Jesus. And that's what I like to think about when I look at the matzah. Now, I can also see the gospel story, not just represented in the matzah, but also in the matzah tosh, this, three, this compartment that has three parts. Now, we're not sure where this matzah tosh came from, like what the origin of it is. 
And there's a bit of argument among the rabbis, no surprise there, as to the origin of the Matzah Tosh. So some say that it represents the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But that doesn't really explain why the middle part is taken out, broken, hidden, and brought back. Some also say it represents the three ancient kingdoms of Israel, the people, the Levites, and the priests. But again, why is the middle matzah taken out, broken, hidden, and brought back? So, as I said, the origin's lost. We're not quite sure where this tradition came from. It's just tradition now. But there is a little known um, explanation that has first century roots. So... Jewish believers in Jesus realize that the unity of the Matzatosh can point us to a unity of one God found in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So why is the middle matzah taken out, broken, hidden, and brought back? It seems quite clear to us that it's because Jesus came to earth, he was broken, buried, and came back. And that's what we learn from the Matzatosh. And it was speaking of the third cup, the cup of redemption, that our Messiah said, this is the new cup. Um, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And this is the very new covenant that God um, promised to the people of Israel. He said it through the prophet Jeremiah. He said these words, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not like the covenant I made with their fathers. I will put my law within them and on their hearts I will write it. I will be their God and they will be my people. So the broken piece of Afikomen and the cup of redemption are taken together at Passover to remember the body and the blood of the Passover lambs, the sacrifices. Well, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. So when we take it at Passover, we know that our Passover lamb is Jesus and we take it in remembrance of him. The fourth and the final cup at the Passover Seder is the cup of Hillel or the cup of praise. It can mean hallelujah, the cup of Hillel, cup of hallelujah. And it's tradition to sing certain psalms. You can see them in your pamphlet, Psalms 113 to 118. These are the traditions, traditional psalms to sing at this time. And I really love, it says in the gospel, after dinner, Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn and then went to the garden. So he probably was singing one of these traditional Hallel psalms. So we can kind of imagine what Jesus was singing when he sang the hymn. So that's the end of the Seder, our shorter version. Um, Passover itself is a night of rejoicing. It's a night of thanksgiving. It's a night to praise God. And when I celebrate Passover, I can praise God not only because, you know, my ancestors, the Jewish people, were freed from slavery in Egypt, which is a wonderful thing to celebrate and remember, but I can also praise God because I have been freed from the greater bondage to sin and death. And that is what you guys can join in celebrating as well. Now, the Passover story isn't quite over yet because my Jewish people are still waiting for the Messiah to come, the Savior who was prophesied in the Old Testament, to come for the first time. So whenever they finish a Passover meal, they all say next, they all finish it by saying next year in Jerusalem, because they're waiting for Messiah to come for the first time, to gather all the people and to celebrate Passover together in Jerusalem. But we as believers in Jesus are waiting for Messiah to come for the second time, for Jesus to come back for the second time. So if a Jewish believer in Jesus celebrates Passover, we finish the meal by saying next year in the new Jerusalem. So that is how we finish our Passover Seder. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, guys, I really hope this has been interesting for you. I really hope you have learned something and maybe now when you read through the last supper or when you take communion you'll have a little little bit more knowledge and just like think oh this was some of the origin um 
At Jews for Jesus here in Australia, we have the great privilege of going around lots of churches and speaking to you guys. And I love, love answering questions and chatting through things and just sharing what we're up to. So I've bought some different um, resources. I have a table at the back. Please come and say hi. Please come and have a look through. Um, and I do want to just tell you, take a couple of minutes to tell you what we're doing here in Australia. So um, as you saw in the video, Jews for Jesus is around the world. There are a lot of different accents floating around. We've got a Kiwi one here. My boss here is American and actually my brother is working with us at, as well. Um, and we are based in Bondi Junction and we have a book and gift shop there. We've got offices up the top, but our landing spot where people come in is a book and gift shop. And we have a big sign that says Jews for Jesus books and gifts. And you can imagine that causes a bit of attention in a quite heavy Jewish community like Bondi Junction and that's kind of the point we want people to notice and every week Jewish people who don't believe in Jesus this literally happens they'll be walking past and you'll see them they'll like look up and they'll sort of read it and then they'll wander into our shop a little bit sheepishly and they're like do you, do you mind if I ask like what is like what Jesus Jewish what is this because the thing is guys most Jewish people have never ever ever considered Jesus could be anything for them in fact a lot of them it's the opposite they've heard from their grandma that the New Testament is very anti-semitic it's a very anti-Jewish book which we all know is rubbish like everyone who wrote it pretty much was Jewish. Like it's, it's, it's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. We know this. They do not know this. Um, my dad and his parents, so my dad is Jewish. He grew up in a secular Jewish family, never went to synagogue, never went to church, never had any religion. But his parents were from religious families. And my grandma had always heard a little bit about Jesus. She had some Christian friends she went to like girl guides with or something. She'd heard a little bit about Jesus. And what she'd heard, she'd always thought, wow, he actually sounds amazing. Like, I reckon I would have been one of his first followers if I'd known about him back in the day. This is a little Jewish girl. Um, but she didn't have a clue how to explore anymore. She literally thought I must be the only Jewish person in the entire world who has ever thought Jesus was nice. That's what she thought, she told me. So she never knew how to pick up a New Testament and discover that Jesus was her Messiah um, until she was an adult. And they, my grandparents had a friend who happened to be Jewish and happened to believe in Jesus and shared the gospel with my grandma. But it was from the point of view of, hey, did you know that this guy called Jesus actually fulfilled lots of prophecies, like all the prophecies, and he showed my grandma. And my grandma said it was the first time she sort of felt permission to explore the New Testament because she wasn't afraid that she'd have to give up her entire identity in doing so. So that's the kind of things we want to talk to people about who come into our shop. I recently met a Russian Jewish lady called Elena, at a um, Hanukkah party. And when she found out where I worked, she was like, oh, I've looked angrily at that shop as I've walked past. But guys, like next minute, she's in the shop having cups of tea with us because she's like, I don't like Jews for Jesus, but I like you. And I'm like, I am Jew. Like, so anyway, but she does, she, she's in, she's, she's, she wants community. That's what we want. We want a comfortable place where Jewish people can experience Jesus. They can explore him. Basically, we're like, hold up, guys. You've been told this all your life that Jesus is not for you, that the New Testament is this. We just want to challenge it. So that's what we're doing. And she's had the chance to, we've explained the prophecies to her. We've explained things from a Jewish point of view where she can understand them. Um, so that's just one of many stories that we have. At our shop, we also have um, events. We had an art show last night. We had five unbelieving Jewish people come to it, mingling, causing trouble, sort of. But yeah, it was great. That's our whole point. We want to bring them in. And I know you guys, this church feels like it's a very outreach church. I'm sure you all have the same heart. Um, so that is, this is now my invitation for you guys. If Something I've shared with you today, whether it was in the Passover, whether it was from the video, whether it was just the stories I've just told, if it resonates with you, 
I would love to invite you to share this, like, this work with me. Now, not all of you can work in Bondi Junction and reach the Jewish people. Not all of you should. I think God puts us where we're supposed to be. But we can all pray for each other. Um, so I would love to invite you. Uh, it's a bit taboo to pull your phones out in church. But if you would like to scan the QR code now, or if you would like to put your names on the back of the pamphlet, there is a little place where you can write your name, your email. Um, oh, I've already torn mine off. I've got a used one. Um, and that way you can stay in touch and I can let you guys know what I'm doing at Jews for Jesus and how you can be supporting me and praying for me and partnering with me in that way. So please feel free to do that. And if any of you guys have social media, I would love a few more followers. I run the social media at work. So Jews for Jesus AU on Instagram, Jews for Jesus Australia on Facebook. That's my plug. And last couple of things, if you would like to support the work we are doing, that would be gratefully received as well. We have um, a square reader. So if you want to give by card, um, I have cash out the back. And I just wanted to highlight this book. This is one of the newest we have in our shop, Mere Evangelism. If you have a heart to reach people for Jesus, but you're a little uncertain how to start, this book has 10 insights from C.S. Lewis. So they're taking from some of C.S. Lewis's teaching and teaching you how to evangelize. So this is a very, very good book. And I have lots of other very good things out the back. So I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you again for having me and hope to meet some of you after service. What a wonderful presentation. Um, in case you wanted freedom to scan that, you already are free. So feel free <laughs> to scan. Uh, I know those who are free already did it anyway. But um, don't feel judged. You are free to, to do that. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Rebecca. That was insightful. Um, I'm sure we'll be looking at um, the Passover differently now, uh, having learned so much. Um, as you were speaking, I was reminded of um, Romans chapter 11. Because, the, you know, when you read that, if you have time, it talks about all Israel will be saved. You know, we as wild branches were grafted in to the olive tree. How much more will God more readily, you know, graft back in those who are naturally Jewish, but if they do not keep hardened by sin, you know, against the, the gospel. So it's probably very difficult for most of us to evangelize Jews. I remember when I was in Israel, I baptized some people on the River Jordan and some two ladies came and said, can you pray for us? We don't believe in Jesus. We are Jews, but I would like you to pray for us so i prayed i prayed with them uh, they explained all they explained to me uh, which i couldn't fully understand why when it's so obvious but here is a team that is evangelizing to the jews you see very few of us would have the guts to go and do it because we don't know what to say they seem to know everything because it's theirs you know what i mean but Jews will be saved in the same way you and I have been saved, by the evangelism. And here is a team that is on the forefront representing us in that cause. We want to reach out to every man, woman, and child with the gospel of Jesus Christ in our city, in our nation, everywhere else. And they are in this niche area, which is Bondi Junction. So they are doing it, and we want to partner with them. So we are encouraging the church to give towards this work uh, as much as you'd want to give they've got their own f post machine as uh, she said but if you want to give through the church you need to give us you know a code so that we'll then transfer these uh, funds to them the code is jfj jews for jesus that's very easy right you can just do that because some have many other ways of giving to the church good be it through Tidely or, or on NAB online or you just transfer to our bank account, any amount we receive will transfer to them and in full. So thank you very much for that presentation. We give a clip offering to the Lord because it has been a wonderful morning.
But I'll invite, I'll, I'll invite Mohan to come and pray specifically for Rebecca. I'll put you on the spot there. He's a, he's a man also so much on evangelism. We went on missions with Mohan the other time to Sri Lanka. So, please pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lovely lady, Lord. We are, we are honored to have someone who has come from the same nation as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for this lady and the work that she's doing. That it will flourish, Lord. We know in, in Romans that it says that all Israel will come to know you. The ones who have pierced him will come to know him. That's a promise of, in the scriptures, Lord. And this lady is on the forefront of this battle. Lord, we know in Revelation it says in the last days Jerusalem was called Sodom. I was wondering why? Because they have gone away from you. But Lord, one day it says in Revelation that all Israel will come to know you. Lord, we pray for that day. That's what you want your people to know you. Lord, we pray for this lady and all what she stands for and the ministry that she works for. Lord, we pray that it will flourish and every Jew in the world will come to know you. We praise and thank you, Lord, that we are also a part of this. We are humbled, Lord. The elders put their crowns down. There's nothing that we have done that you have. But you have given us the honor to become a part of your redemption. Thank you, Lord, for this. We are honored. We graciously, we humbly accept your redemption. Lord, we pray for each and every Jew in this world that you will help them to know you. We pray all these things in the lovely name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I invite us to stand as we close today. We're not going in a hurry. There are resources on the resource table there. And we can have so many um, questions we can ask Rebecca um, and see how much you know we can learn more about Israel. We love the Jewish people. We are a privileged people to be in the Commonwealth of Israel. So thank you for representing us, uh, ministering to them. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your maid servant you have sent to this place. Today was a different day, a service with a difference. We have experienced your presence, Almighty God, in our midst, and we have been learning more about Christ in the Passover. Lord Jesus, you are the Passover lamb. No more sacrifices. And we are grateful for that. Because we didn't have to die. You died on the cross for all our sins. We thank you for that sacrificial love. Thank you, Holy Father, for giving us Jesus, your only begotten Son. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for strengthening us every day as we continue to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you glory and honor. We pray, Almighty God, for the congregation, Lord, to then put in practice with understanding the very things we have learned. Together, Lord, we are learning, and we want to practice what we learn. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, this morning as we go, let us now go in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the uh, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, uh, love of our Holy Father, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. God bless you. Let's go in the foyer, have a fellowship there, a cup of coffee, and let's look at the resources Rebecca has brought. Thank you.